Okay, so you're very welcome this morning to our webinar on the UCD Diploma in Corporate Governance. Um, I'm delighted to uh, welcome you all. And um, as you can see on screen here, I have Professor Neve Brennan, who is the Programme Director of this Diploma. Um, Neve has kindly uh, offered to come and talk to you about the programme, but also about you know, uh, corporate governance issues that have happened in, in the past and, um, you know, that she will give kind of her thoughts on that. Um, it's great to hear about the programme from Neve because she designed it and it has been running for a very long time now, since 2004. And um, so, you know, what better way to find out about what actually happens on the programme then from Neve herself. And also Neve will be joined then by past participant Eileen Jackson, who uh, Eileen was a part of the class of 2018, and she will talk about her experience of the programme. So a lot of you here today on the webinar are either after applying for September's programme or thinking of applying or in the process of applying, and then that you're um, not sure and you want to hear a bit more from both Neve and from Eileen and from myself um, about what is involved, the commitment and all of that. So this is the best way to find out. Um, I would invite you to put your questions into the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. Um, please don't hold back. If there's anything at all you really want to know about the programme, we would encourage you to ask those questions. Now is your chance to ask both Neve and Eileen and myself. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Neve, and um, I'll come back on screen then at the end for the Q&A and for uh, just to talk about some practicalities around the programme. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Annabelle, and good morning, everybody, and thanks very much for attending this webinar. I hope you find it interesting. Um, so I was going to say a few words about the psychological and behavioral issues in corporate governance. And on the program, of course, we cover the regulations. Uh, corporate governance is a regulated activity. So we cover things like the laws and all the rest. We cover uh, codes of practice. But the aspect of corporate governance that I find the most interesting um, and which I think actually explains at times a lot of what goes on is the psychological and behavioral issues. And I'm going to talk to you this morning about one case, uh, a case of a corporate governance failure. And um, when governance fails, it hits the front page of the newspapers. It attracts attention in a way that creates the impression that governance fails a lot. And I think that impression is a bit unfair because actually we don't hear from all of the companies and organizations that have good governance that don't fail. Um, so um, I just would caution uh, my story of governance failure, that governance failure, in my opinion, is an exception rather than the rule. Um, and But many of them have seismic consequences and they really do catch attention. And I'm playing it safe. Uh, I'm not going to pick a corporate governance failure from uh, locally. I'm playing it safe and I've picked a corporate governance failure from uh, the US. And the corporate governance failure is this company called FTX. And it is a cryptocurrency business and it collapsed in November, 2022. So it's a fairly recent failure. Uh, it's currently in liquidation and in a somewhat ironic uh, situation, the liquidator of one of the biggest financial reporting frauds ever, Enron, the liquidator of Enron has now become the liquidator of FTX. His name is John J. Ray. And the collapse of FTX was absolutely seismic. It was valued at 32 billion, 32 billion dollars. And 8 billion of, com of uh, customer assets have disappeared. Um, so, I mean, the amounts of money involved in this case are absolutely gargantuan. So I'm now going to show you a picture of the CEO. Sam Bankman Freed. And um, I think he was a hard worker. You can see that uh, he used to sleep in the office, but he founded FTX 
at the age of 25. He founded FTX in 2017 when he was 25 years old with a co-worker that he met when he briefly worked in a place called the Center for Effective Altruism. So there was kind of high um, moral ambitions around this, uh, which he learned from this Center for Effective Altruism. And um, he would contend in relation to effective altruism, he would contend that his job was to make a lot of money so that he could give a lot of money away. So that was his argument. And given what's happened since, you have to put a question mark over the argument. And again, you have to ask yourself about the psychology of a person who would be thinking like that, that I have to make a lot of money so I can give away a lot of money. He didn't give away a lot of money. Allegedly, he defrauded a lot of money, as it turns out. But anyway, he was viewed and his youth, I think, partly contributed to this. But he was absolutely lauded by the business community. And it's funny the way these kind of people do become lauded by the business community. So just here are two images to show you know, the meteoric rise. He was compared, for example, by fortune as the next Warren Buffett. And then he was in the uh, top Forbes 400. So this was a guy considered by everybody to be absolutely a wonderkind. But what I find really bizarre about it is we have been there before. Do we ever learn? And I'm now going to show you two uh, pictures of, uh, maybe you could call her his twin sister. Another wonderkind who ended up on the front of Fortune and the front of uh, Forbes magazine. This is Elizabeth Holmes, uh, the CEO of a company called Tyrannos, now completely collapsed. And she modeled herself on Steve Jobs of Apple. And so she always wore these black polo neck shirts. Um, and again, her rhetoric was similar to Sam Bankman Fried in the sense that the altruism that she was going to save people, help them with their health, a very high moral altruistic story but she ended up defrauding them. Um, and she had this machine that she said would mean that you didn't have to get blood taken from your veins, but that a little pinprick would be enough. But the machine was a complete fraud. It never worked. And she was spent the whole time trying to convince people that the machines that she had uh, were brilliant. Uh, groundbreaking medically, but actually they never worked and it was all a complete and utter um, scam. But it's similar to Sam Bankman-Fried, she had this altruistic story. Anyway, back to Sam Bankman-Fried. Um, and this is an image accompanying an article um, posted by a California-based uh, institutional investor called Sequoia. And Sequoia was one of the biggest investors in uh, FTX. God help the investors in Sequoia because Sequoia invested their money, not Sequoia's money, their money in FTX. And obviously that's all gone now, but they were one of Sam Bankman Fried's biggest cheerleaders. Um, and um, uh, by the way, if you go and look for the article, um, you won't be able to find it. They've removed the article, which they posted, by the way, in September 2022, and FTX collapsed in November 2022. So less than two months later, uh, this um, flattering piece uh, was the subject of a massive collapse. Um, and he, they talked about Sam Bankman fried His intellect is as awesome as it is intimidating, gushed, the profile. Um, and again, what got them to portray him in the way they did was because of his approach to the principles of effective altruism. 
One's goal is to optimize one's life for doing good. Most often good can be done by choosing to make as much money as possible in order to give it all away, earn to give. Now, that was their rhetoric. They never gave it all away. They uh, allegedly defrauded it. Uh, so, um, and um, another thing about these kind of wonderkins is that they end up hobnobbing with the great and the good. So here is an image of um, the great and the good um, that he was going to speak at an event uh, sponsored by the New York Times on the 30th of November. Um, sorry, it was hosted by the New York Times and sponsored by Accenture. And you can see the great and the good all there um, and with Sam Bankman fried And in fairness to him, there was a lot of speculation. Would he even turn up to the event because FTX at this point by the 30th of November had collapsed, but in fairness, he did turn up and there he is, he turned up online. And um, the legal case is still going on. Um, and he is currently under house arrest, living in his parents' house in Palo Alto in um, California. Um, and um, th there were some really interesting corporate governance little events that occurred um, before or during the collapse. So here's one, um, and it was very, very strange, but here is a Twitter post that he put up um, in August, 2021. So a year and a half, we'd say before the collapse. But when you think about that post, there is something very strange about it. So here he is saying, yippee, we got through the audit. And actually, when you think about it, surely there should be no big deal in getting through the audit. And why is he so relieved to get through the audit? And maybe with the benefit of hindsight, you're saying actually that po Twitter post was flagging something. He was worried about the audit. He got through few and he put up a Twitter post to, um, you know, express his relief. Um, but it's also very interesting uh, because, and we touch on this in the program, corporate governance differs depending on the jurisdiction. And this company was in the jurisdiction of the US. Um, unlike European companies, US companies do not have to have an audit. Um, so um, it was privately held. Um, the, its financial statements remained private, again, unlike uh, companies in the EU. Um, so um, we don't know who the auditor was. The audit, I think, was done voluntarily. Maybe Sam Bachman fried was worried about the legitimacy of the business, so it would make the business more legitimate if he could say that he got through an audit um, and the financial statements weren't publicly available. So telling us that he got through the audit tells us very little because we didn't we couldn't see for ourselves the financial statements. But the other thing that was misleading about this is that it was only one part of the business that passed the audit. And the more toxic part of the business wasn't subject to an audit at all. So where you have a set of group companies, you have to ask yourself how many companies in the group were the subject um, to the audit. Um, and then <laughs> when the company collapsed, um, the Financial Times got hold of this. And this is a company worth 32 billion and it was recording its accounts on an Excel spreadsheet. And what's interesting about that Excel spreadsheet is that the Financial Times could see that the person who prepared that spreadsheet was Sam Bankman fried himself. It wasn't like the uh, finance director or anything like that. Um, so, you know, his fingerprints are very closely um, all over this. Um, uh, so, it, the Financial Times was able to draw a lot of kind of insights about uh, what was in uh, this um, Excel spreadsheet. 
um, so again, there are several issues around this uh, lack of transparency with the financial statements, question marks over the audit, probably question marks over the dominance of a single individual. And again, a lot of the corporate governance codes, their objective is to spread power across a group of people and not to have a single dominant individual. So um, in our part of the world, unlike America, actually, the roles of chair and chief executive have separated. But Sam Bankman-Fried um, was wielding an awful lot of power. At this point, by the way, he was, I think, 29. But what is, you know, should one be surprised that a, a young fellow with very, very little experience would make a mess of his company? Would we, should we be surprised about that? But what I find from a corporate governance perspective incredibly surprising is all the people who lost money to this company, right? And here are some of the big investors. They are institutional investors, household names, SoftBank, Sequoia, BlackRock. And you have to ask yourself, what were these institutional investors doing? Pumping shareholder money, not their own money, shareholder money into this basket case into this private company, which was not being audited, where the financial statements were not publicly available. And you would wonder and expect that a company like BlackRock, which is the largest single investor in the whole world, it has so much assets under management, bigger than the GDP of any country in the world, except for China and the US. So you'd wonder what a company like BlackRock was doing, putting money into FTX. And you have to ask yourself, like what were the due diligence processes in BlackRock that could allow BlackRock um, to punt money into a company in that way? So you have to question BlackRock's processes. You have to wonder, did somebody override BlackRock's processes? And then from a psychological and behavioral perspective, um, there is some speculation that what was at play here was FOMO, fear of missing out. So these big institutional investors were pumping investors' money into FTX because they were afraid that they would miss out on the next best thing, maybe instead of doing um, you know, their proper due diligence. So I hope you found that little uh, case study interesting. And if you sign up to the UCD corporate governance, uh, diploma in corporate governance, there will be loads more of uh, those kind of case studies and all the rest to try and understand why things go wrong um, from both a regulatory point of view and a psychological and behavioral aspect. So um, just to finish off what I'm going to say, um, and if you sign up to the program, you'll find in the course materials that there is a architecture of the program. And there's two versions of it. There's the one that I prepared and there's one that Dr. Margaret Cullen prepared. So we both view the architecture in slightly different ways. But um, what we are trying to do is cover, cover all of the basic building blocks involved in corporate governance. Um, which includes the more formal regulatory aspects and which also includes the behavioral and psychological issues at play. And um, so we've got all of the basic building blocks um, which we bring together to, to sensitize participants to the complex, it's very complex issues at play around boardrooms and um, within uh, organizations. Um, so, so that's all um, that I um, have to say. Um, and please do put any questions you have um, into um, the chat box. So I'll stop sharing now so we can go over to the next um, part of the webinar, uh, which is uh, I'd like to introduce you um, to um, uh, Eileen Jackson, 
who is a graduate of the program. Um, and um, I, I just want, and thank you, Eileen, very much for uh, your time here this morning, but just to get a sense for people thinking of signing up to the program, like what's it like from a participant's point of view? Mm -hmm. And I might just start, Eileen, by um, asking you first, um, you know, what was your background coming into the program? Well, I had come from the, the education sector and I was at a, a, I was a moving, I was transitioning to a new stage and, and I was drawn to, I suppose I had held a number of board roles. So it's important to have that, you know, there was a, there was a, a governance background a little bit because I'd heard, held a number of board roles, whether both in non-for-profit, charity and state boards. And I was always interested in and appreciated the role of, and the importance of good governance and how that could bring out the best and the worst in an organization and indeed how it could make or break uh, the whole tone of an organization so um I, and i was also as well as of course the laws and and regulations and that compliance area i was very interested in the uh, elements of behavioral and, and psychological issues and right. how important they were so they were they were issues in the background that drew me to being being drawn as so I was specifically to the course and and so when I went to find something that that would meet what I was looking for at the time I was drawn to the the high highly valued um course qualification and I was drawn to the quality and the range of the course content um and interestingly for me what turned out to be absolutely one of the 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 the, the, the benefits was the peer-to-peer -peer learning yeah. It's 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 nurtured very strongly by by you and your, your colleagues, and it is a, it's an absolute bonus. Uh, I found it wonderful. Both both of those elements, both the the, the I suppose oh, those three elements: the, the 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 value of the qualification, the course content, and the peer to peer learning. All of which, to be honest, they all surpassed my expectations. So it was a good it was a good call at the time. Um. Well, just um, Eileen, and for the people on the call, um. When I started this program in 2004, I was the only person, I stroke UCD and my colleagues in UCD, we were the only organization offering training to directors and to people mm -hmm. interested in governance. Mm -hmm. And since then, a lot of other organizations mm -hmm. have piled into that space. Mm -hmm. um, and my own response to that kind of com increased competition, my own response to it was, to keep positioning the UCD diploma as the blue ribbon, uh, best in class uh, mm -hmm. governance uh, education. Mm -hmm. And I've always moved it up to the high end. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think the mix of academic and practical mm -hmm. makes it very, very rich and very, very deep. Yes. Um, and then Eileen, just to pick up another thing that you mentioned, um, you know, Executive education is very different to undergrad, mm. to postgrad, let's say the MBA. And what distinguishes executive education is the peer-to-peer -peer learning. Mm. So, mm. you know, some of the participants in the class are no more than the lecturers. Mm. So there's the class itself has an incredible repository of mm. knowledge and wisdom and experience. Mm. Um, and I'm glad that you found that. No, value. absolutely. It was, it was. Yeah. Fantastic opportunity, yeah. yeah. And, and in fact, I, at the end of it, I actually felt it was a, it was a privilege because there's no way I would have had an opportunity to work with people from those diverse, um, all all at, at at high levels in their own particular areas. Yeah, so that, that was. Yeah. Uh, Give us some feel for the kind of backgrounds of your classmates. Well, it was uh, we would have had people who came from completely different story uh, the own uh, story. So we people maybe. My, there might have been somebody who was moving from a, a CEO role in a family run business, who was moving from that um, handing that over to another generation and but moving to chair of the board. So so very different. That's a tricky change. And, and so watching somebody go through a, a, a long personal investment in a family business and changing role and having to let somebody else take on that executive role and they were moving. To, that was uh, that was really special to, to be part of, of that person's story, for example. We had people in senior roles in uh, state, semi-state, um, uh, not-for-profit charity, right across. And we, we, we had, I don't know if it was just our year, but we had a really rich diversity 
of, uh, of participants and all either some coming towards the end of a stage in their career and maybe moving across to another area, which probably is what I was doing. I was moving from a leadership role in education and I, I, I wanted to move more into governance and, and uh, regulation area. And, and then there were others who were on the, the forward trajectory within their own career, whether it was in the Gardaí or within a, a, a charity organization. Uh, yeah, it was yeah. Yeah, very diverse. I hope that. So, um, you know, uh, there would be people who are in management roles mm. taking on the program. So they're in management roles with a governance mm. flavor. Yes. And then there would be more, you know, non-executive directors yes. or people aspiring to be non-executive directors. Yes. So we have both a a aspects, uh, um, you know, represented in a class. And I mean, we have no control over who size up to do the <laughs> diploma. But remarkably, every year you, we do end up having a nice, rich mix of backgrounds uh, in the class. Uh, which is really fantastic for the peer-to-peer -peer learning. And, and also, for, for example, we would have had somebody who moved on and, and went into a, a CEO role in, within a, a, a not-for-profit charity sector. And that the knowledge of the re relationship between the executive and the board, that, that I'm sure not only the, the qualification itself, but the experience, on, and I know this person would have, would have, would have commented on the, the richness of the uh, learning from peers as well, that I think has to, has to make you a better applicant going forward in a career as well. It has yeah. to help because your, your understanding and appreciation of that, of that relationship. And indeed, those who are looking at um, uh, aspiring to non-executive roles, to have an appreciation of, the, of, of your role and the difference between your role and an executive role, it's a tricky one for somebody who's who's had a background in an executive and yeah. moving to it because mm, you have to have respect for, for, for both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so um, Eileen, um, maybe you'd talk to people on the call about the workload involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, well, again, I think a lot of, of thought has gone into that. I don't know if it's changed over the years, but certainly I would say it's well paced. I found it well paced, certainly. Um, you have an expectation, of course, that there's going to be a, a, the, you have to invest um, time in it. But it clearly reflects an awareness of the work demands of the participants at the level that they are within their own careers and, and uh, the responsibilities that, that they carry. Um, so it acknowledges that these are people with busy and demanding careers, I feel. And classes were scheduled uh, in the evening. So from 4, 4 30 to 7 30. So it meant that you could you could plan your day, plan your meetings and, and, and your other your other responsibilities. Um, I felt assessment was well paced. Um, apart from exams, which I had sworn I would never do again. Um, and you know, and, and I'm 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 still <laughs> I'm definitely never doing them again. And uh, I'd say at this stage too. But they apart from the, the, the group and individual assignments were spread out well over the two semesters. Really, um, I found them very enjoyable. Um, I love the engagement with the, with the groups. And indeed, one of the funny things about the group is that you become quite you become, you become quite close in your in your working together. And then you change group, and and we have no control over our groups. You change group in the second semester, and I agree with that. By the way, I think that's a good good plan. Uh, you change, and there would have been, I remember, um, maybe unsuccessful petitioning to keep the same group for the second semester and you weren't having it because one of the learning elements is that you will learn from being with a different there's a different dynamic in each group and you and you become attached as a new group and so that that was all very good but but anyway that 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 was great sharing for those group assignments some individual assignments and then you have to take on board that the exams at the end and that it and be ready for that and to plan and um, do, do a bit of thinking about the it's an open book exam. I'd never done that before. A uh, number of of, uh, of my classmates wouldn't have done that before either. And so you just need to be ready and pace yourself, I think. But I think the program itself is, is well paced, actually, the timing of it. And workload wise, to factor in that there are two uh, weekends away. So you need to you know take that on board and, and plan plan around that. Yeah. Does that, does that answer? 
There's a couple of questions coming in, Eileen. Great, but I'll just a couple of things that you said first, and then I'll yeah. go to the questions. Mm -hmm. Just in relation to the timing of the lectures, 4.30 to 7.30 mm -hmm. on a Monday and Tuesday, some people are traveling to Dublin mm -hmm. to attend those lectures. And we can give anybody in that situation access to what we call a breakout room. So you can use a breakout room in the Smurfit School as your kind of hot desk office mm -hmm. if you're traveling uh, uh, to, to attend the lectures. Mm -hmm. In relation to the assessment, um, the assessment is continuous assessment on the one hand and exams on the other hand, open book exams. So there's no memory work. And um, my first of all, stu some students love the continuous assessment. Yeah, some students love the exams. Yeah, that's so right. A, a kind of a blended yeah. assessment. Approach, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, which which kind of caters for everybody's yeah. taste, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And in particular, you know, again, I the exams are not hard, I don't think, you know, uh, but people put a lot of effort into them. Um, but, um, you know, it's again, it's just a kind of little quality mark on a programme that has positioned itself at the high end as the Blue Ribbon Rolls-Royce um, programme. And um, my reasoning for the weekends away is that, you know, we'd have a meal on a Friday night. That's great. We'd have a glass of wine. And it really the weekend as way is for the bonding mm. amongst the group. Um, and it's very enjoyable. So mm. Eileen, I'm going to pick up a couple of the questions from the participants, sure. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so the first question from Eamon Judge um, for Eileen, how much of a disadvantage would, would you have been at if you hadn't had prior board experience, I'm in senior management with a decade plus executive committee responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So what, okay. how would you that? No, no, I don't think it would be a disadvantage because I, I, you, I, I, I would assume that you still have an engagement with a board and indeed particularly with a chair. Um, so you will have an awareness. And indeed, as you described, as you were talking about those two case studies, I, I, I absolutely agree with you, Eve. I mean, will people ever learn? You know, there, there were because I remember a, a big case breaking as, as we actually as we were doing our course with you and and uh, and uh, looking at some of the course over the years to say history keeps repeating itself. It's just incredible. Um, but but so sorry to, to to focus on on that question. I think everybody has had engagement if you've been in because I would have been in a leadership role, uh, but I, I would have had to attend board meetings and and, uh, and act as secretary to a board. Um, so you have had some engagement. And um, I think it I, I think it will just enrich your 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 capacity to do your own uh, executive role. Yeah. I mean, Eamon, I would say, Eamon, with uh, 10 years uh, executive committee mm -hmm. responsibilities, you would bring a huge amount yeah. to the programme that other people would learn from you. Yes. And equally, you will learn from yes. some of your classmates. So, yes. uh, you know, having that rich experience is is a huge mm -hmm. uh, advantage. Uh, yes. and we want people like you uh, in the programme. So I'll move on to the next question. Annette Stapleton, are all classes online? Annette, I'm sorry to tell you, no classes are online. The only time we had online was during COVID. We got through it. Uh, the students, I think, in that year would speak well of it. But you just cannot have peer to peer learning of the quality that you have in face to face discussion. And um, every evening there's a break for about. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Eileen. Yeah. No, 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 not so. Yeah. No, sorry. Yeah, I, one of the. One of the the perks one of the lovely parts was i mean you look at that time table you go from 4 30 to 7 30 at the end of a busy day really but actually there's a break in the middle between two um, lecture sessions and um or workshops and we have a, a, a meal and very healthy but very delicious i mean the first time we went up i think we were all our jaws dropped we were not expecting it um and without exception i think most people found it one of the perks, again, a lot of people are coming from a busy day. There's more remote, uh, we were talking about remote there just a moment ago. Uh, a lot of people may be working remotely and be able to manage the, the scheduling of the, of the course better than maybe previously with the travel and, and so on. Um, and because I know that in the past, there could be somebody coming with their breath and their fist coming straight from a, from a work situation and may not have had a chance to, to have uh, something to eat or whatever. That was brilliant. And it was also a chance for engagement with colleagues. 
and with maybe your assignment uh, team or whatever. So uh, it, that that was, uh, and it was a lovely break from uh, the, the constant concentration of a lecture situation. So the pacing of the evening between 4.30 and 7.30, it actually flew. Uh, and it was, and it was uh, as I say, it was split up with the, with the perk of, of having a really lovely, lovely yeah. meal. Well, well, it's a perk to have the meal, but the objective of it, Eileen, is that the peer-to-peer -peer learning yes. is, is happening over those meals. Yeah. There also weren't tummies rumbling. You know, there weren't, because people, because there, people, there would be people who would arrive and they literally would be coming straight from maybe an afternoon solidly. And so that was that, you know, that side of it as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so I'm going to go on now to the next question, Martina Ryan Doyle. And Martina has asked about the split between group and individual assignments. Mm. Nearly all of the assignments are group assignments. Mm. And again, it, it's kind of re replicating, if you're on a board of directors, you have to mm -hmm. work together as a group. Mm -hmm. So the group assignments are, you know, people having to work together mm -hmm. and learning about working together as a group. I think there's um, one or two individual assignments, Max. Uh, I know that I have one. Uh, um, but it's mainly group assignments. Um, and as Eileen said, so in the group assignments, you're getting to work intimately with your group. And just when you've got comfortable and happy with them, <laughs> the best group in the whole class, you're then forced to go to a new group in the second semester. But again, it's good experience, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, another question from Gemma Amadi. Uh, in addition to the classes, on average, how many hours a week do you need to commit? Um, well, I would, yeah, Eileen, you, you yeah, said- Yeah, it's a tricky, I, I, you might be able to, I, I would find quantifying that uh, difficult because it depends on uh, your role, say within, within an assignment. Uh, you know, say, say there's a deadline coming up, your obviously your input is going to be greater, and um, it depends on your role within the assignment. You might be part of the research part, or you might be responsible for the presentation. So, at the various stages of the the um, project, that you know, th there's a greater commitment. Um, and again, some people are great at doing the early morning uh, before they start the, the, their their regular day job doing work. Then others are night time workers and prefer to spread it out some prefer to give it a blast of time over the weekend so th that I think is is a very individual thing Neve, you might be able to add, add more to that but um certainly coming up to, to the exams everybody will feel that it's more intense from a vision point of view and I and I would just in case I forget to say it's important I feel to to plan how you're going to manage if you haven't done so already an open book because I know we would have found some people come in with the slimmest little Pie, uh, pack and clearly very organized very focused and lots of tabs and others will come in with, with bankers boxes and know exactly where to find what they are going to need the, the source and so on so those there would be a huge range in how people approach some of yeah. these things well that's true so the level of effort that people come in varies uh, yeah. there'd be some people who put in maybe you could argue far too much effort yeah. is it worth it but Gemma just to um respond generally I mean it is a commitment and mm. I don't want to pretend mm. that it's it's not a commitment you know so so there is a substantial commitment in it um and um you know if you give it that commitment you get a lot out of it um so what you put in is what you get out of it so um but I'm I'm I mean it's not it's it's it, you know it's not an impossible task but it's, it's a substantial commitment um, and no point in pretending otherwise, you know. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so Tolum, I'm going to skip your question because I think it's going to be answered later on by Annabelle. Um, okay, so I think there are all the questions and thank you very much everybody for those questions. Um, so um, back to you, Eileen, and um, 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 I've asked, I, the, the question is, how did the programme live up to your expectations? Mm. Or maybe to ask a different question, how is it different to your expectations? I, I suppose, what, what were my expectations? I, 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 they were very, the expectations were, were, it was different in that the the peer-to-peer the, the -peer was probably the element that I hadn't factored in because I hadn't really thought through how that, how, how that might work. Um, so it surpassed my expectations. 
because that I, I it 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 met what I would have hoped would be the academic um standard and, and the material was interesting it was relevant it was practical um, and again I suppose in that way it was different because I wasn't sure if it would be a little bit more turgid than it actually transpired to be um, it was engaging and I know you all one, one often finds I don't know if others would agree but but doing an academic course you don't necessarily look forward to 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 the the lecture or whatever I almost without exception looked forward to the to the the sessions on Mondays and Tuesday evenings because there was a vibrancy there was a, a level of um, variety you see in the different formats whether because there wasn't broken up it wasn't straight lecture format there was lots of variety and so that that certainly uh, was different to my expectation and the camaraderie was something that I hadn't considered it wasn't on my list at all so that was something the camaraderie with the class and and everybody watching looking out for each other if somebody and again people some people were in very high profile um positions where you might have read about them in the newspaper that morning or, or they you know they were dealing with a high profile case that was running or something and um so one would be very conscious of the strains that people were were carrying and there'd be lovely support and and camaraderie there i think um I hadn't really thought through how the off-campus weekends would be. And they were, again, that was a social side that I hadn't expected. Um, so um, as I say, I didn't only live up to the expectations, which were very much on the, what the course content would be. It surpassed it by those other elements. Um, and yeah. thanks, Eileen. Um, so Eamon is back with another question. Um, and Eamon says, my role in a multinational involves routine international travel where I may not be able to attend an occasional session. He's okay. definitely going for the weekends away. He wants that glass of wine, Eamon. <laughs> <laughs> um, but as the sessions are not online or recorded, does that automatically eliminate me as a course candidate? So first thing, Eamon, is we do not do hybrid. Because if you do hybrid, mm. unfortunately, it's, you, you're, it's, it's just not the same mm. as everybody having to be there face to face. Mm. So hybrid doesn't work in in our opinion mm -hmm. um, and of course everybody will miss the odd um lecture and um you 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 will be given all the course materials anyway mm -hmm. um and you know Siobhan Lane Marge is the program manager so she will make sure that you know you've got everything that you need for any session that you miss your classmates and the people let's say in your group will make sure that they will tell you what happened in any of the lectures that you miss. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that everybody will miss some lectures and I think that they are easily able to keep on top of things, notwithstanding that. Eileen, do you have any insights on that? No, I think that's, that, that's yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, uh, no, no, I think that's, that's I think anything I say, I'd be repeating what I've said. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it 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 will involve um, Eamon, a bit of negotiation, let's say, with your group. Yeah. So if you're not available for X, that's y, a good point. Yeah. Actually, the group will will you can have all you'll have off. You know, separate. You once you're in a group, you'll have an engagement with them separately, so they can give you backup. Yeah. You know, and yeah. Or or you know, the workload within a group can be negotiated amongst. Yes members yes. depending on people's commitments and all the yes. rest so there's, actually, there's sorry another element of that Neve, is that people will have, have um it, and again it's why i'm a great believer in i know there are lots of arguments against group work but actually people it, it's it's a group working together to find their strengths and that's a good experience within whether it's in an executive or, or a, a governance role anyway and and you work together and you complement each other's strengths and yes. and that will also arise if somebody has a crisis so it might not just be that you're you're traveling and you're not going to be available. It may be that something's happening in your work or in your personal life that you you you're under a bit more pressure, and it's it's helping each other through. That's what I meant by the the, the support within the yeah. camaraderie. Yeah. So Eileen, um, last question: the epilogue. So um, what's happened um, to you since you completed the program, and how have the learnings contributed? Uh, to life after the program. 
Gosh. <laughs> um, well, uh, as well as holding directorship roles, uh, and I'm now I'm chair of, a, of a, a board subcommittee as well, which I don't know if I would have had confidence to do previously. I now work in consultancy in, in governance and uh, regulation, and uh, with a particular interest, a continuing interest in, in education settings. And um, and I'm currently course coordinator and lecturing in corporate governance and ethics in um, an MSc program in the Quinn Business School. So that's an opportunity that would never, I just wouldn't have been, uh, I think, on my radar at all. I wouldn't have even considered something like that previously. So, and 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 I find myself so constant governance. You just, you just become, you see things through a different um, lens. The experience just changes your approach to, you won't read the newspaper or listen to the news in the same way ever again. You know, yeah. your, your knowledge, I think it it, it feeds into to your knowledge of current affairs. And as we said previously, sadly, these things are in the news every day. There's something and there's yeah. always another. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. so Eileen, thanks very much for sharing those insights. I think it's really useful for potential prospective participants to get a flavor as mm -hmm. to what it's like being a participant on the program. And you very kindly have offered to talk to people offline if they wish. Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's very kind of you. Yeah, there may um, be people who would rather not ask something in a in a more public forum, so more than happy. Yeah, sure. Yeah, actually, there's one more some one more thing has come in. Uh, okay, it's just Eamon uh, thanking us for our helpful insight. So thanks, Eamon. So at this point, um, myself and Eileen have finished saying what we're going to say, and thank you again for your attention. And I'm going to pass back over to Annabelle, who will talk about the logistics of the program. Uh, thank you, Neve and Eileen. I'm just going to put up these slides here now. Um, so, um, as it, uh, actually, Neve and Eileen, if you want to turn off your cameras, sure. um, yeah. So the, as Neve uh, rightly mentioned, the next intake of the programme will start on the 4th of September. At the moment, we have the class over half full. Um, as I mentioned, there's a few of you here on the on, who wanted to come along today to really find out what is involved. And I, I know the two ladies spoke a lot about the commitment. And, um, you know, I'm making sure that this is the right time for you. So it does run um, every year. Um, but this is the next intake, which will be the 4th of September. So if the timing is right for you, then um, it's good to get in touch with me. Um, Neve, um, you know, mentioned about the breadth of the, 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 I suppose, the programme material that is on the course. And this is a list of all the different areas that are uh, covered on the uh, syllabus for the programme over the two 12-week semesters, so the full academic year. And um, so it's, a, you know, you really do come away, as Eileen mentioned a few times, that word confidence, that you have so much knowledge. And then the practical experience of being in the classroom, doing those group assignments and all of that, that it's almost a bore in role play really because you know you're learning about group dynamics and different people's styles and all of that and um, so this is the content that will be covered over the entire program and um, just some key details and uh, you've mentioned uh, the the, it, the program has been going on a long time now so since 2004 and um, we have well over 400 alumni and once you do the program you become part of our, our alumni network so we often run events and, you know, and invite you back. And it's a great way to catch up with people. Also, we have an easy, and so we keep in touch with you about, um, you know, programs coming up and news um, and, you know, insights maybe from faculty. So it's, it's a nice way to keep in touch. The class size for September's um, start, I hope to have a class size of about 25 to 30 people. Um, and within that, then it's uh, from public, private and not for profit sector. 
Um, so it's, it's across the board. Um, the fees, I know somebody asked about the fees. So the, the full fee is 15,940. Um, we do have an alumni business, uh, a UCD business alumni discount. So that fee is 15,143. And, you know, people often ask, you know, is, is the payment up front? And absolutely not. We do give you the option to do um, an installment. So you pay the fee in four installments. So the first installment is paid as soon as you uh, um, apply for the program, and then you pay the other three during the program. So your all your fees will be paid before you finish then at the end. Um, I know somebody asked about, I think it was Annette asked about, um, are any of the classes online? Unfortunately, no. And um, for good reason, we have them all in person, you know, for that peer-to-peer -peer learning. And they're uh, based here in BlackRock in Smurfit Executive Development in the UCD Michael Smurfit Graduate Business School. Um, the, the next intake, which is starting in September, it will run until the 22nd of April next year. Um, and you're in here every Monday and Tuesday evening from 4.30 to 7.30. Um, there are a couple of exceptions in the timetable, and I can share that with you. I think where it might be a Monday and a Wednesday night, I think it happens twice throughout the, the whole academic year. Um, but you get those um, dates in advance, so you'll have them in your diary. Um, there's two weekends away, one in October and one in March. I think the first one in October is in Dunboyne Castle, and in March... Um, I think it's in Farnham Estate. Um, so it, that's a lovely um, opportunity to get away with your class. Uh, I know a question has come up uh, during the week. Are these weekends away mandatory? They're not mandatory, but we would encourage it because that is where, you know, you really bond with the people in your class. So we would encourage that you try and make it and you have the dates in advance. Um, and all the cost of the weekends away and um, the food on the Monday and Tuesday evening in class, that's all included in the price and all your materials. So your program manager, Siobhan Lane Walsh, will be giving you books and notes and everything is printed for you so you have it then for your open book exam but it's all included in the price so there's no extra cost once you've paid your fees um the exams then are in december and then another one then in april and it's it's a day of exams um two days uh one in each of the semesters um, I, I wanted to mention, you know, a lot of people come and they do this um, a program, the Diploma in Corporate Governance as a standalone diploma. Um, but then it, just to let you know that it is part of an MSc, a master's pathway. It's called the MSc in Business Leadership and Management Practice Pathway. And what that means is that once you've done the Diploma in Corporate Governance, you have the option to do two other diplomas to qualify with this MSc in Business Leadership and Management Practice. And other options of diplomas on that pathway are things like the diploma in um, uh, business finance, leadership, coaching, high performance sales. Uh, we have some new additions that we're adding on now um, this autumn and next spring. Uh, one in aviation finance, a diploma in AI and analytics, and also a diploma in digital transformation. So, it, you know, there's a wealth of um, options in there. And it's great then to, um, if you did decide that you would like to come on and do more study that you can, if you do three diplomas, you'll qualify them with an MSc. The application process then, um, so uh, a lot of people um, ask, you know, what is involved? How will I know if I'm going to be accepted on the programme? So if you have a level eight uh, qualification or above, um, I get you to fill out um, an online, I send you a link to an online application form. You fill out the form, you upload a copy of your qualification transcript from your previous qualification, um, a copy of your digital photo um, for, or sorry, a digital photo for your student card and a copy of your passport photo page for ID purposes. Um, um, you must have at least five to 10 years middle to senior level ma management experience and be, we would encourage that you either be sitting on boards or be thinking about sitting on boards or that you're some way involved in corporate governance in the role that you're in. Um, I have had many questions in the past about what if I don't have a, a previous qualification and absolutely you can still apply. Um, the only difference is you still fill in the same application form, but you fill in an additional form called a career portfolio form. And that literally documents your management leadership um, experience. Um, and then that's taken with a copy of your CV to the University Admissions Board for approval. Um, so it, absolutely, we, we 
we uh, would love to have you on the program. And um, I know a question that uh, has come up uh, recently, you know, as people are ringing me to have calls about the program, it's about, well, you know, am I too old for this program? Um, you know, I'm I'm in my 60s or in my 70s and absolutely not. You have so much experience to give to this program. And, you know, Eileen and Neve alluded to the peer to peer learning that that's a huge um, benefit of the program. And if you have all this experience to give, we would love to welcome you on the program. So, you know, of all ages, um, uh, that adds just to the, to the diversity in the classroom. Um, this is to give you a flavor of who has applied or is in the process of applying already. So as you can see, the people are coming from the uh, participants are coming from these companies. So there is a lovely range of public, private and not for profit sector and all the indus industries within that. So, again, the peer to peer learning and the diversity in the classroom is, um, it, you know, it's going to be great uh, this September. Um, so I would encourage you, as I said, I've only a few places remaining. If you would like to apply or you'd like to even learn more, or you have questions that you didn't get to ask that you would really like to ask, absolutely send them to me. Um, and um, if you are thinking about it, but you need to look into maybe funding or you want to look at the commitment, is the timing right? Get your family or your, your organization on board that they're going to support you on it. Um, that um, please do let me know and I can provisionally hold you a place and there's absolutely no uh, pressure to take it. Just let me know and I can release it. Or if you decide to apply, then I can send you the link to the application form. Um, when do applications close? Essentially, we do, you know, we'd be recruiting right through the month of August um, and then a class will start on the 4th of September. But I would expect the class to fill fast now after this today, because a lot of people were just waiting to hear from Neve and hear from Eileen uh, to know exactly what's involved. Um, so that's it, folks. Thank you so much um, for coming online this morning uh, to join us. Um, I hope that you got loads out of it. Um, please do get in touch if you'd like to learn more. Um, also, thank you to Neve and to Eileen. Um, it was great to hear from both perspectives, lecturing on the programme and also as a participant. And I, th I feel, you know, you learn so much from that conversation with both of them. Um, I will be sending a copy of this recording um, to you and also a copy of Neve's slides and my slides. Um, and if you have any questions, then you can just reply to that email. Um, so I wish you a great day and thank you so much again for, for logging on this morning. Thank you.